Welcome back, everybody. I'm having a fun pre-chat with the wonderful David Shetra. You know him as Tom Cole on Cobra Kai. My son is watching you right now downstairs. <laughs> uh, he was begging me. He's like, you got to get Tom Cole on your show. So, Alex, here you go. Uh, you also may know him as, as Tommy Shepner uh, on uh, uh, Titus. Yep. Uh, and we'll ask him all about that. So welcome to the show, David. Thank you very much. And thank you, Alex. It's nice to have a big fan out there. You got to get me on. I appreciate that. Yeah, Alex is my uh, kind of my biggest PR. I have my 11 year old who uh, who tells me who I need to get, and then tells everybody about the show. So absolutely, um, I'm grateful. Yeah. Um, so you and I were uh, we kind of just started chatting about uh, how interesting the world of acting is, right? You mm -hmm. know, you've been doing this for 30 years, and we're yeah. going to talk about uh, you know different parts of your career. But Cobra Kai kind of blew up, and you have a very memorable character which people love to hate, and yeah. <laughs> it's, it's even you know more uh, hopefully opportunities for people to get to know you as an actor and a person. So, mm. how is that experience for you? And did you see a huge shift between YouTube Red and then Netflix uh, uh, afterwards? Well, let me take the second question first because that's easier to answer. Yes, huge yeah. shift. Um, when I got Cobra Kai and they told me it was on YouTube Red, I honestly didn't even know YouTube had a their own programming channel. Um, right. And I and then I knew it was a pay channel, so I'm like, oh, okay, it's another smaller downgraded version of like Hulu or something like this. And I just was like, okay, I picked up a guest star. It's on YouTube Red. It has to be a subscription, and I'm like, I'm not watching it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to tune in to see myself to pay money. I just look in the mirror, like, yeah, there you are. Um, but it, that was a few years ago, actually. Um, yeah. and then YouTube read, I, when I had talked to, um, Ralph Macchio about it, he said, you know, we don't know how many years YouTube Red's going to pick us up. So I was like, okay, it's a one and done. I'm out. And I did the first season. And then all of a sudden I got a call back and then I heard that it was going to Netflix. Mm -hmm. And I was really, really, uh, not shocked. And not surprised, but really happy for the show because I knew at that point yeah. the the worldwide audience is going to get involved in that. And I mean, there have been shows uh, on Netflix that I never would have watched had Netflix not picked uh, picked it up and then did the um, the dubbing. Uh, yeah. There's been a, a few shows that I've watched, and uh, and those shows have taken off. And true to form, Cobra Kai did the exact same thing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I am really happy about how it went uh as far as for me and the the character i really originally thought it was a one and done um meaning i'd come out i'd do the show and then we'll see where the storyline goes uh they did invite me back in the second year for season two i didn't make it because i was actually shooting another show the same week so i missed out at being in season two but then they brought me back for season three and had that really nice turn of getting daniel to go out to japan um, you know what, I, Alan, I have no idea what's going to happen. Season four scripts have been written. They're in production right now. I don't know if Tom Cole's coming back. I hope he does. He's a great foil for Daniel, but yeah, I'm crossing him, but that's just, uh, that's how it works. It's like, you're only as good as your last job. <laughs> It's it's true, and um, <clears throat> again, I, I I really like the character. As a matter of fact, again, I've watched the show more than uh, more than a few times now. But it surprised me because you are showing up in two episodes. I mm -hmm. felt like I've seen you in more than two episodes, so I had to check myself. But uh, it's it's good that when you think you have the character be in more episodes <laughs> than they were, that means that it was a rem somebody that uh, that you remember. Um, well, I also, I'll, I'll, I'll give that up to the writers as well, because yeah, well, what they do is they've, they've threw little Tom Cole Tom bombs in there left and right. And right. Um, yeah. I wasn't I in the show at the time, the uh, but they uh, made a they reference made to me. So it kept the character alive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then, you know, uh, going to the, uh, to the first scene that, or, uh, the first episode that you were in yeah. where, uh, where Daniel does, uh, does the kick and the, and the coffee thing. Uh, how many how many takes was that? Because that was that was an interesting kind of unexpected uh, little uh, startup. Yeah, well, uh, two on that. Two things. Number one, it was boba tea, and I've never drank boba, boba tea in my life. So okay, I didn't even know what it was. I picked it up, and I'm like, "There's things floating in this 
That's what is this? So they're like, it's boba tea. So I never had it. Um, I thought the gigantic straw that they gave me, the, the double double size straw was just that perfect class of just douchey enough, um, which I loved. I love that choice. Um, the only problem that we had was an issue was we had to set up and, and uh, Ralph was really funny. He's like, hey, guys, you know, I'm I'm 50 something years old. Don't expect me to flip around and do 30 takes of a he goes, I'll fall over. He was really very, very funny about it. But it was the setup. The hard part of a thing like that is is to not look like it's coming, but you yeah. have to you have to place it where he can kick it mm-hmm. because he's coming from a blind spot. Um, we only did it twice. We did we did a couple of takes without anything in it, and he yeah. just kind of went through the motions. And then we had one that first kick that he did was the take that Perfect. sprayed absolutely everywhere. It was a fantastic kick. We did one for safety, and that's the one where. Um, and he knows about it, so I always I, I kid him when I saw him the third uh, in season three. I was like, "Yeah, this thumb didn't work for like six weeks because <laughs> he mm. caught the he caught right at right at the heel perfectly on there, and he just really got me good." Um, but you know, paid paid for pain. It's all right. It's all it's good. But yeah, that was a that was a great shot. I love that kick. Yeah, because again, I was hoping that you know, kind of, it would be a why that they didn't, they wouldn't have to do inserts on it. And, yeah, uh, and no, he did it. He did it. it. He was, he's really, uh, he practiced a lot. There was a lot of, lot went into that, and there was also safety too. I mean, you're coming around, um, yeah. not professional stuntmen, and it's like you could bust some fingers. I was, yeah. I was in a fight in Hawaii Five O of an episode that I did, and. Mm-hmm. I, we went through the motions a hundred times with the stuntman. And when we did it full out, I mean, I, I had issues with my hands for a couple of weeks after that. It just takes one, one wrong crack, you know, but you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah well, that's, uh, that's what we have uh, memories for. Right? <laughs> and stuntmen for. <laughs> usually. usually. Um, there's, there's another you know, wonderful show that I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of. Uh, it's Warrior. Uh, Warrior. It used to be on Cinemax. Now it's HBO Max. Uh, and it's it's a you know it's a drama. It's historical and it has a very high level martial arts. So there's a lot of stunt work there. Yeah. The stunt people basically look at the actors. Uh, and God, I forgot what they call them, but they basically call them you know the the voice uh, you know voice uh, stunts or something like that. Like mm-hmm. yeah, we'll do the work. You'll just come out here and you'll see yeah. if you want. And give it back to us. <laughs> so. Yeah, on Titus we had a stunt guy, Tommy uh, Tommy Primo, who was uh, learned to do stunts on the show. Now is a full time stunt man in L.A. And uh, just watching his progression, doing some small stunts on Titus, uh, and then now he's a full blown in films, like jumping out of buildings, fire explosions, mm-hmm. being burned, uh, the whole thing. And I've I've talked to him about it, and he posts a lot on Facebook about it. And it's just mm-hmm. a world that I'm like, good for you, dude good yeah. for you i'm just gonna be over there in the safe area you know I've, yeah. ha- I've not been in a lot of things where i had some crazy stunt i've been around explosions and that's not fun you think it's fun it's not half the terror that you see on the actors faces is kind of real <laughs> when, when things yeah. blow up behind you <laughs> yep uh it's yeah stunt guys are not getting up credit they should be uh, getting no. their Oscar, uh and it's it's incredible um, I, I'm a big fan of the action genre, and you know, action genre would not be around if it weren't for the stunt guys. Stunt, that's, yeah. That's it. Um, so yeah, going going back to uh, to Cobra Kai, and again, kind of yeah. looking through the demo because I didn't watch Titus. Uh, he, you know, mm-hmm. I came I came at 14 uh, to the United States, so I don't. I need to kind of double check when Titus was on exactly, but it, it was 2000. Uh, 2000. So I was I was definitely here. It just mm-hmm college, whatever, I wasn't watching it. Yeah. Uh, what am I talking about? I'm older than that. Uh, I was already married in 2000. There was no college there. So maybe that's that's why I didn't watch it. Or you're just getting old, Alan. <laughs> Good. I'll, I'll, I'm going to be okay with an excuse. Point B, I, I, I got to uh, to watching um, you know your demo reel and mm-hmm. some of the work down there. Uh, and you know having Tom Cole fresh in my mind, it kind of reminded me of the character that you were playing, uh, or the same energy of the character on Star Wars, uh, Star Wars, the Star Wars, yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. So uh, that made me think of, you know, when you were going through the audition process on, uh, on Cobra Kai, mm -hmm. did anybody say, hey, you know, we liked what you did there, do the same thing uh, that we envisioned, <clears throat> or basically it's, hey, this is a, you know, douchey uh, sales, uh, car salesman, you know, go there. <laughs> There's the word. Um, it's kind of, it, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, when I got Titus, the produ uh, executive producer, Jack Kenny said, actors are usually 90% of the character that we're casting. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, of all the guest stars that I've ever done in the shows that I've been on, uh, I usually play a douchey character. So basically you just called me a douche. Uh, <laughs> I just think they're a lot of fun. Uh, I have played a lot of them. Uh, usually when I'm wearing a suit and a tie, yeah. It screams I'm coming in as a douchey character. Uh, I've never been the romantic lead. I've never kissed the girl. I've never gotten, you know, I've never boy meets girl. It's always like boy meets girl and then meets the douchey father. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I played corrupt businessmen. I have played the rapist. I have played, you know, uh, the guy who does the shady deals in the back, but all with a smile. Uh, so, the, uh, but yes, you're exactly right. The starter wife, well, I was an agent. I was a Hollywood agent who was basically yeah. telling my character, telling the character that I was representing, Deborah Messing. I was like, sleep with your ex-husband, get the deal done. That's what we do here. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, we, she's like, I'm not gonna reward him for bad behavior. And it's like, that's what Hollywood, Hollywood is. We all get rewarded for bad behavior. And it's very true. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with, <clears throat> excuse me, with Tom Cole. It was, it just, I step right into it. And I, I think it's one of the funny reasons why they, they kind of cast me a lot in those is because in my real life and personal life, I am completely not that. I don't like confrontation. I don't get in fights. I'm usually the guy behind the leader in the back going, what's going on? I'm not doing it. I'm going to see somebody else do it first. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. It, it, I don't know, Alan, about your life growing up, but I'm not a big dude. So anytime I ever got into any physical confrontation, confrontations when I was little, I, I never, never walked, you know, uh, went through it all. But then I'd go home, you know, and you're in your bathroom or in your bedroom in front of the mirror and you reenact the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then now, now you're Sylvester Stallone. You know, yep. now you're the guy. You're like, you say all the things you were going to say and you were going to fight the way you were going to fight. And it's perfect because it's in your bedroom or bathroom. Um, yep. That kind of character is what I play. It's the guy who knows if you hit me, if you touch me, I sue you. Yes. And so it gives me the freedom and the leverage to say what I want. So what are you gonna do? And I love playing those characters because I was trying to explain and uh, there's been some really great people that I love to watch that I kind of look uh, look after when they, when they do those is always find the likability of the guy, even though it's a bad thing make him likable where he's entertaining. Because if you just play him, like <laughs> I got called a douche clown in season three. If you just play him as a douche clown all the way through, it's one note. But if you yeah. just show a little human side or a little bit of humor, it's like, he's so annoying, but I like him. And mm -hmm. if I can get you to do that, like, I don't like Tom Cole, but I like him. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I like that. Because you always want to see what he's going to say next. And, and that's what I try to do, you know. Yeah. So I, I, I'm professional douche. What can I say? <laughs> it's uh, the the great thing about the acting industry, which is the bad thing about the acting industry, is that once you're good in a particular role, people want you to be in it for for a long time, and yeah. that gives you longevity. And uh, you know that's that's a good uh, part of the business. Um, so how did uh, Cobra Kai come about? Was it just a regular audition? Your agency yeah. wanted you for. Yeah, uh, basically, they I had a submission. I went to the casting director in LA. I got put down, uh, recorded. It was sent to Atlanta, and uh, they what they call what they pinned me, meaning uh, they went through everybody and they picked like their top two or three choices, um, and then I got it. And I was really surprised because a, as I said, it was YouTube Red. B, I would have figured it was going to be a local hire um, because you know they got to fly me. They got to fly me from LA to Atlanta. And one of the one of the perks of flying X amount of miles under a SAG contract is if it's more than two thousand, you have to be put in business or first, which we all love. And um, then you got to put up at a hotel, you get a per diem. Yep. So I was like, that's a lot of money for a YouTube Red show for a one one day shoot. Um, yep. But they said 
you know, the exact producers on the show say, yeah, we looked all over Atlanta and, and like, you, you couldn't find somebody douchey enough for in Atlanta. You got to go to LA. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. But, but that was, yeah, same, same, uh, same process as always come in, you get recorded, the mm -hmm. tape goes away. A lot of times now with COVID and even before that, uh, a lot of times producers would, would come into the room so they would get to see you and you get to audition for them in person. Now mm -hmm. it's like with technology, they're basically like, just record everybody, upload it, send it to us. We're just gonna make the, make the uh, decision. And then being in Atlanta, they can't fly back and forth for that small role, so. Yeah, and I did speak to a bunch of, because there were a lot of uh, local Atlanta actors on. on yes, Africa. yeah. Uh, and I talked to quite a few of them, and they're all you know wonderful and very talented. But mm -hmm. I'm glad I'm glad they found you because uh, it's, it's <laughs> me too, uh, me too. Uh, before we get to Titus, I, I you know you know perusing your IMDb uh, pro, uh, I saw that you were on my favorite you know drama of all time. You uh, you did one episode of The West Wing. Yes. Um, yeah. What what was that experience like? That was uh, well, it's nerve wracking. You know. I kind of I kind of relate for people that don't know. I kind of relate being a guest star on an established show is like showing up with your significant other at an office party, you yeah. know, because they know everybody. You walk on, you walk into a place that's completely already going. Everybody yeah. knows everybody. Everybody has their stories. Everybody sits together. Everybody welcomes everybody, and then you show up, and nobody knows who you are. <clears throat> um, it was a a walk and talk. That's what West Wing was famous for—the walk and talk. Most yeah. most uh, most guest star stuff is is like takes place in a single room. It's stagnant. It's usually actors in a chair or at a desk or you know, uh, doing one action. West Wing is basically like here's your briefcase, here's your papers. We're gonna walk down the hall. We're gonna make a left. We're gonna make a right. We're gonna go in the room. We're gonna continue the scene. And it's a walk and talk, and you're constantly going. It's a it's a challenge. Uh, you got to be good on your lines, but it's a phenomenal show, and anytime you get to to get to be in a show like that with such great writing, you just basically just say the lines. Don't even act. Those are one of those great shows where you just, it was written so well, you just say the lines and everything's going to be fine. Yeah, it was a, it was really, it was an honor to be on that show. Yeah, I, I, you know, my phone doesn't show me what uh, what season you were on. It just shows an episode. What season were you on? I couldn't remember i don't even know it was late in this it was late in the run uh, i think okay. what west ring west west wing ran about maybe eight, eight years eight, eight, eight nine eight. years i i would have to say i was probably in the eighth seventh or eighth season got it yeah i was so, I, martin she martin sheen was president at the time no um was martin sheen president i think it was during the the democratic runoff and i was a democratic lobbyist yeah. So I think this was during the switchover. So I, I thought as an actor, you're like, ooh, I'm a Democratic lobbyist if the Democrat wins because West Wing went parallel to what was happening in real government. Yeah. So if, yeah. if, if the Democrats win, I go, maybe I'll get another, I'll get another episode. The yeah. stupid things that we do to go, maybe I'll work again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the reason why I'm asking about kind of, um, uh, you know, where you were in the show is because Aaron Sorkin uh, was there uh, yes. And I, you know, the first four and Aaron was, you know, my lines have to be perfect. You mm -hmm. can be off script even with one word. Did you right. find the same thing when you were there as well? Did that continue? Yes. Or you got yes. No improv. There's no room for improv. There's no time to improv and there's no need to. Um, there's no dead space. No. Basically, it's like it's like a conversation like this that we're having right now. Um, it, there, It's so full. And you, I remember one of the interesting things, normally when you get a script for a one hour or a half hour, it's like 26 pages, but they're shooting like 22 and they build in a little bit of extra. This thing was so thick and I'm like, how are they gonna shoot all of this in you know, 50 minutes or 45 minutes? Because yeah. it's just packed with language, but you just go. It's once we turn the camera on, yeah, I have no improv, no, don't, don't do anything except just read the lines and go home, please. <laughs> yeah. That's that's amazing. And uh, what what is your process for again in, in like the West Wing where you had to memorize a lot? What was uh, what is your process for memorizing lines? Because it's not just the memorization of lines. It's also well, you know, here's your version of the lines uh, the day right. off. 
you know, right. so what's, what is your process for quickly getting them in your mind and then hopefully going? Well, you know, it, it's a good question because the, the lines will change and that's the frustrating part. Um, mm -hmm. You'll get your two scenes or three scenes or one scene and you get it the night before and you read it and you're completely stone cold, 100% down. And then you show up in the trailer and they go, oh, they have rewrites. And you're like, dude, really? Sometimes it's not a big deal on a show like The West Wing yeah, or, or like a, a, a drama or a, mm. a, a serial drama, like a lawyer show or a doctor show. If things change and there's technical terms, that's a, that's a, that kind of sucks. But um, repetition, 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 repetition. That's all you get it down because you don't know what the other actor is going to be doing on stage too. Normally when you get a guest star, you'll actually work with hopefully one of the series regulars. So yeah. my, my process is really very simple. Learn your lines as best as you can. I try to watch the great thing about technology is I can go back if I've never seen the show, I could go back and watch two or three episodes the night before to get the idea of how the show works, yeah. just to get a, a temperature. And then you just have to go, all right, I have my lines down. Here's the actor and they may change it up. They may improv, they may, cut you off, they may go, well, we're cutting this line, and they'll do it on the fly. So as long as you get the base of it down, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Very nice, and then uh, going to Titus, because there are a lot of fun things, a lot of fun scenes that yeah. I, I saw, kind of in yeah. for this idea, a chance to do, uh, you know, physical comedy. <laughs> you a lot, a to yeah. A lot of just kind of the cringe-worthy, awesome, you know, line, <laughs> which was great. So uh, it seemed like that uh, type of show, at least from my limited experience with it, would be a place where you get a chance to play, where you get a chance to improv. Uh, Every time. Yeah. Okay, good. Every time. Uh, Tommy Shafter was yeah. kind of like the Marilyn Munster, for those of you who knew the, the Munsters. Marilyn Munster was, you know, the, 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 the one that they all thought was the ugly one, the, you know, the weird one of the group. Um, Tommy was the completely uptight, anal retentive, OCD, hypochondriac kind of character. Uh, once again, I can't play the regular guy. I have to be in a sweater or sweater vest. <laughs> One of these days I'm gonna be in a really cool suit. Um, uh, and so I got a chance to do a lot of physical stuff, which I love to do, um, and, and got a chance to work at the physicality of it. Because in a series like that where you spend Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, prepping and getting ready for Friday night shoot when it used to be the days of the four camera. Mm -hmm. um, it's like it's like theater to me. I grew up with a theater background. I got a BFA and an MFA in theater. So I have tons of theater experience. So I was like, I'm on a stage. This is a set. They're over there working. I can go to the set where this thing takes place and I can spend an hour and a half figuring stuff out physically. So I love that. And Tommy was, uh, really versed on language and very emotional. So uh, lots of highs and lows. It was a, such a fun character to play, you know, annoying, annoying, but funny. <laughs> and did, again, you were there for 54 episodes. So this is yes. you know, a, a, you know, serious kind of uh, role that people got, uh, got used to on. Yeah. Did you find that afterwards, uh, did it hinder uh, your ability to get other roles where you pigeonholed in a particular, you know, you know, this is the type of role that you can play? Yeah, you know, the show was very successful, but it did bump around a little bit. Uh, we mm -hmm. only lasted three episodes. We didn't go to syndication, unfortunately. Um, so I didn't run into that pigeonhole mm -hmm. a little bit, not much. Uh, I did, ironically, when I was on Titus, all of my guest star appearances when I wasn't shooting the week of Titus or right after were for sitcoms. And then when that kind of went away, I started doing nothing but one hour dramas. Yeah. So it didn't actually pigeonhole me, um, but it, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if the show, if the show had gotten successful to the point where we did seven, eight seasons, it might've, you know, I know that there's, you know, you, we talk about the um, family matters, um, we talk about Carlton from Fresh Prince, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you get into this, but then you look at, you got Michael Scott, look at, look at Steve Carell. I mean, that's, sh that show ran for seven, eight seasons and you know, he, 
he's such a brilliant actor. He just like, no, I'm going to not do that character anymore. I'm yeah. going to go off. And Steve went off and did other stuff. And uh, so I think it just really depends upon how the actor, after establishing one character, moves through his next sets of, uh, of gigs. But, you know. No, I, 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 I that's, that's kind of the, the interesting part to me of talking to so many actors and seeing um, kind of the career progressions and seeing the, mm. the highs and lows. Um, because when it comes to longevity of how do you have a successful career in this industry, um, I'm not sure that there is a ton that we can say, you know, this is the way, this is the way, this is the way. It's no way. More on, yeah. You know, it's talent, it's being a professional, it's, uh, you know, networking and having the right uh, kind of uh, people. Because if you're in the circle of really successful uh, creative people, then usually they uh -huh. tend to work together. And uh, just continuing to do things because people drop off all the time. And the yeah. ones who persevere with it are the ones who, you know, kind of stay in it. Have you found anything else that I can add kind of to that list uh, of uh, how to stay in the industry for a while? No, I think, I, I think you hit it. Um, you have, you have a, a particular thing that you did that set your character up, that gave you, now you have, um, you have what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, the cachet, now you're a series regular, now the show's a hit, now you're being invited to do other things. Now yeah. it's up to the actor, you know, for example, you, let's say you're in a show I was in, let's say, let's say Titus took off and it was like seven or eight seasons. And then all of a sudden Titus is done. Now yeah. all that comes in and a lot of actors experience this, all that comes in is basically the same version of what they just did. Yep. So it's up to the actor to go, do I want to continue to work or do I want to challenge or do I want to move to do something else? And there's also those little things in between. And you talked about when you're, when you're managed and your agents and the people in charge of your career are handling you correctly. If you find yourself in a series regular playing one character, there is the hiatus. You've got three, four months off. There's an independent film that could be done. You could go do theater. You could do a guest star and play something completely different than, than what you're doing just to let people know that there's another side to you. Range is definitely important, but people will want to, to jump on what's, what they see that's really hot right now. That's why if you, if you remember when Friends came out, Friends mm -hmm. was such a huge mega hit in the third or fourth season, I remember auditioning every single other audition for television sitcoms at that time when Friends was out was Friends drop, Friends comedies. It was nothing but Friends in an apartment, Friends at a restaurant, Friends at a doctor's office, Friends, Friends. Everything was a group of people together. They took the template and then tried to run with it. So, you know. <clears throat> it's it's interesting and it's not just in our industry as well because again you know i, I work uh, a, a an outside the industry job yeah what do you do alan what do you do on your on your um, days off here <laughs> i i do uh it and hr consulting so okay. uh that, that's that's kind of what i do so this is my lunch break and then i go you, know, <laughs> you have an, uh, you have an adult job <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I mean, fortunately and unfortunately. unfortunately, I get you. <laughs> but what the realization that I had is that, again, I am kind of this, this multifaceted guy uh, outside of the industry, right? Mm -hmm. So I do HR, I do training, I do IT consulting, I do all sorts of uh, things within it. And it's very hard for me to kind of find jobs because when people are looking at my resume or LinkedIn profile, they they don't want to spend enough time to actually understand, oh, he can do this, this, and this. They're right. like, okay, this title in four different positions. Oh, he's a consultant. That means he doesn't like permanent. Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. And people want comfort. They want the same thing. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I understand, and I can do that. Our industry does that, too. They mm -hmm. like the person in a particular role. Yeah, I just want to put them in my project in that yeah. role. So. It's you're exactly right. I like that you you're using your right side and left side though. You use your right side for your 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 regular job and use your left side for your uh for your creative side. So very well done, Alan. Uh yeah, look, comfort, security, knowing what you're getting is huge. Uh, a lot of people don't want to take chances. A lot of people will always say, 
in our industry as like you just saying as well as yours it's like well let somebody else take a chance on you first and then when you do it i'll cast you or yeah. let him do some more stuff first i don't the, the biggest thing that i got starting out and every actor will get is i don't know his work i don't know what he's done um mm -hmm. which is why a credit is really important on a good show because you actually take that one credit if it's a top 10 show or it's a highly publicized show like my my managers were saying at this point the second cobra kai hit on netflix they're like get your reel redone and make sure cobra kai is leading it and because it's that's what's hot right now that's what's important and that's what they lead in well oh i haven't seen david in a while what's he's doing cobra kai it's like oh great all right i'll see him just based on that to that it's this, nobody wants to take chances everybody's afraid yeah. So as soon as you bust through, then then it's a little bit better. Yeah, and uh, again, I'm 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 happy that uh, that you're going with it, and I'm, I like you know from a working actor because this show has been called. And I I actually have come to really enjoy it. The show has been called the Inside the Actor Studio for the Working Actor. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I I'm really digging that description. Um, I like seeing that, okay, you know, he's, and again, looking at your work, you've done guest stars, you've done a bunch of co-stars, you have a bunch of, uh, and now, yeah, Cobra Kai is here, so there is another opportunity for people to, mm -hmm. to look at you again and say, okay, good, maybe add more more to that uh, fuel. Yeah. Well, um, I've, also, I've also done, um, because those things are so few and far between, series regulars are great, those will pay the bills for years. Um, yep. But a guest star, you know, is, is is a good check. But once you once you're done and your shooting's over, and they say, "All right, everyone, say goodbye to David," and you're off the set, you're back in the breadline again. Um, mm -hmm. But for 30 years, I've been doing voiceovers. Uh, I've had a really, I mean, knock on wood. Uh, I fell into it back in New York, back in uh, '99 and two, uh, '96 when I moved there. No, I'm, hold on, I'm having I'm having an Allen moment. Wait, not when I got. <laughs> 80, 80, 90, yeah, in 1991, when I moved to New York uh, after grad school, um, I was lucky enough to fall into it through my on-camera agent at the time. And that has been an absolute deal breaker for me. It's kept me from having any other job. Uh, I've only had this job for 31, 32 years. Now. I'm in my 31st year. Um, and had I not found that, mm -hmm. it just offers another source of income, on-camera, voiceover, and within the voiceover, there's commercials, there's animation, there's industrials. So uh, just a lot of a lot of good opportunity to keep working while trying to get the bigger, more celebrated gigs like this. So and and voiceover is something that stays with you. Uh, you know, talking to Stacy Keach, uh, who you had a chance yeah. to work with. Yeah. Uh, Stacy has done a ton of voiceover. Ton stuff. of voiceover. Yeah. Uh, he's 91 years young. <laughs> knock on wood. Uh, so it's is incredible. Ad Asner, you know, yep. ton of, and basically Ad, uh, I think Ad actually even said that, well, you know, my body is not allowing me to do, you know, a lot of uh, on screen projects, but sure. my voice does. And uh, it's, it's really, really, uh, it, that's, you know, talking about the longevity, that's one thing for sure that I've heard from many actors of voiceover keeps things uh you know nice and oiled yeah it pays the bills and mm -hmm. the great thing is it's still creative um mm -hmm. unlike uh it, like for example I, on an average week i'll play 15 20 different characters in my booth for a video game or an animation project or just regular commercial work or character for radio if there's any radio left um but it's, it's always, and it's very quick. It's like cold readings. You get the yeah. script, you do it, and I send it out. Um, so it, it always keeps keeps your, uh, I guess it keeps your creative instincts going and your improv going, because there, there's tons of improv in VO, um, yeah. and especially with the characters. And like Ed had said, Ed Asner said, and even Stacy Stacy will attest, yeah, when your body starts to give out on you a little bit, um, voiceover is very forgiving because the great thing is you don't have to get dressed up. You could do it in your pajamas. You can do it anytime during the day. You can you can start it, stop it, come back to it in 20 minutes and go, nah, that didn't work. You could do it over. You can do as many takes as you want because you're doing it at home. 
Uh, you don't do a lot of voiceovers hardly anymore in casting offices. Now with COVID, we don't go in anywhere. We Everything is yeah. done from home. I do sessions from home. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and you know, it's, it's a great way to make money in your pajamas when you can get it. But it's also right now with COVID, one of the most intense places to try to get work because mm -hmm. everybody's doing it because production has been shut down for the most part here in LA. It's true. Um, Chicago is actually, knock on wood, Chicago is, uh, is doing uh, fairly well uh, in terms of our schedules. Uh, that's that's things, good. Things are shot. I know you know, Vancouver, Toronto, they're doing well. Yes. Especially yeah. Now. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. So a um, few more few more things I wanted to get your thoughts on. Again, you, you know, a lot of people know you from the comedic side. But then again, you've done a lot of the episodics and you've done a lot of drama. Um, mm -hmm. From your perspective, you know what? Which one do you enjoy more? If you if you have to pick one, which is a stupid question, but I'll ask it. <laughs> no stupid questions. Um, uh, if I had to do it more, I'd love to be on a on a. I feel where my energy and where my template sits for my 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 whiny nasally voice. Um, I feel comedy's definitely a a stronger suit for me, mm -hmm. and I love the reaction and the laughter. I, I really do. Uh, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not, uh, you know, there, people say, well, doing comedy is just as hard as doing drama. I, I just feel right now there's a whole other emotional side to drama that's harder to get into than comedy. I think comedy is based on timing um, and it's also based on situation. So drama l lends itself you something bad is going to happen it's about to come up and you can kind of feel it happening with comedy it's it's a it's a smack in the face it's mm -hmm. some somebody says something that was inappropriate i call it the fart in church you know it's like things that are really funny that just people don't expect to happen i love that aspect of it mm -hmm. and uh, you know i'm not being uh debbie downer but people need to laugh so much lately <laughs> people just need to laugh and i think when this COVID thing is over um hopefully very soon i think you're going to see such a surge in comedies and stand-up comedy and all of that because right now if you watch everything mostly on programming on hbo and even the sag uh awards is mm -hmm. right now they're looking at all the films there's so much drama so much heaviness because mm -hmm. it goes it goes in relation to what's happening in the world Writers will write what they know and what they're feeling at the present time. So I think right now it's just down. And I think when this thing lifts, I think people are just going to want to get outside and laugh and feel good. So I hope to be I, hope to be part of that. I, yeah, I, I hope so for you as well. <laughs> uh, is there is there a particular show out there that you're like, guys, you know, you're calling your managers and your agents and saying, get me on that show. That's my show. I need to be on it. <clears throat> Um, I watch a ton of television. Unfortunately, hopefully nobody from the networks is listening. Uh, I don't watch too many network dramas and network sitcoms and stuff. Um, um, no, I don't have a favorite. Uh, you know, you say stupid question. It's like, yeah, that's a great, great, David. You want to get back on Cobra Kai and go, no, I don't have a favorite show. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Cobra Kai is kind of like the kind of genre that I'd like to do. Yeah. It's not super heavy. It's not super cheesy. It's just yeah. like right in the middle. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm binge watching everything right now. But it's the funny thing is I'm binge watching mostly dramas because that's what's out. So, yeah. um, But there, there are a lot of dramas that are using or they're just tremendously good at comedy, like The Boys. Yeah. The Boys is a drama. But the Boys is absolutely brilliant yeah so good but it's also yeah. shock value too and i love because that they took they took the superhero genre and spun it and said yep. it, when they try to do a human side to it where superheroes yeah. are impenetrable but no they they put in impro uh in, inappropriate sexual advance they took they took regular everyday stuff and added uh, added superheroes to it so i think the boys is so good everybody in that show is good everybody um yeah. billy billy crudup and i'm so sorry that oh um it's on apple tv uh the mm -hmm. morning show 
Yeah. Uh, the morning show, you watch a character that that is fantastic. Um, I mean, Steve Carell is, is fantastic. Jennifer Aniston is is so good in that show. But Billy Crudup, that's Billy Crudup's show. Um, when you watch him playing the head, the head executive, just just looking for things to uh, to get involved in and, and manipulate with a smile on his face and go, I love this guy's character. I watch that show for him. So that that's the kind of role that I would love to play. It's like every time he walks in the room, you're like, oh, no, things are about to get interesting. <laughs> Those are the characters that you want to play. I get you. Perfect. Well, last thing, you know, yes, um, um, I know Netflix is very careful about this and don't reveal anything that shouldn't be out there. But from your perspective, right, mm -hmm. so from the perspective, what you would love to see in Tom Cole, if you had a chance to talk to the writers and ask them to write it for you. Ah. That... Well, it's interesting. Uh, as I said before, all the episodes are written for season four. They're already okay. done. They're in they're in the can. I don't know yeah. any of them. Uh, honest, honest engine. Don't know any. Oh, don't anything. Uh, oh my God! They said that was horribly honest engine. See, I'm not gonna get letters for that one. Uh, uh, so I don't. I don't know the episodes. I don't know what's happening. Um, and I. This is one of the reasons why I'm hoping Tom Cole comes back. I can't right now figure out where he fits into season four because it seems based on an. I think season three was amazing. Uh, he was the best. It was so good. Based on where season four is rolling, it looks like it's going to take Daniel and yeah. and they're gonna they're gonna meld the dojos together to go against Crease. So I don't know where Tom Cole fits into all that. Uh, there seems to be a built-in for that, unless the only thing I could think of is Daniel went over to Japan and took my money. He took my contract away from me from Doyona, so he yeah. got it back. So that's yeah. like you know you screw with me, but don't screw with my bottom line. So yeah. whether Tom Cole can get a, can get back at Daniel that way and go after LaRusso Motors, because he tried to buy it once, took the yeah. contract. The only thing Tom Cole has leverage on right now is, is you know, if I take your dealership, I take you down. So yeah. that's the only thing I would think. But I think season four right now seems to be pretty locked in the other stuff, but we'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's got to be, you know, culminated at the tournament. <clears throat> so, you know, that's yes. that's the that's that's episode ten. We know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but hey, maybe Tom Cole can uh, can work with Crease on something, right? That's because... what I'm saying. Maybe Tom Cole backs Crease in his dojo. <laughs> you know, he's his financial backer. Who knows? You know, we'll Crease needs. Crease only has a number of students. Everybody doesn't like his dojo. It's like, but Tom Cole's like just funneling money to Crease, and then mm -hmm. Tom Cole's sitting in the do sitting in the at the uh, at the All Valley tournament, you know, yeah. behind Crease. Who knows? I'm just throwing things out there, just trying to get a gig, man. <laughs> yeah, and you know, get Ford involved, right? You know, Tom uh, Tom Cole could sell Cobras. You know, get get that whole thing. He he keeps talking about it's an American car. You know, it's an American plant, my American cactus. So, yeah. which goes against Tom Cole's whole thing in episode the first season, or it. But you know, I, I I'll change. I'll change for money. Who doesn't change for money? <laughs> well, David, it's it's so much fun talking to you. Thank you so much for jumping in. I really appreciate it. Alan, I appreciate it too. And thanks for asking me because, you know, as I said before, as a guest star and a journeyman uh, actor talking about you're in the actor studio kind of thing, mm -hmm. us, us guest star recurrings, we don't get that kind of play that series regulars get. So getting a chance to do something like this is is terribly fun for me. So I appreciate it. Uh, you're valued just as much, if not more, on my show. So you're always welcome. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And thanks to everybody for tuning in to another episode of The Love of Acting. We know you love Cobra Kai. We know you love acting as much as we do. And that's why we have fun doing this for you. Thank you. Yep.